It's a fact that people do rush off to computers and hope to have their thinking done for them. Everybody does it when they start. I did, and I'm sure you will too. It costs money, and the results can be disastrous. That's no joke. In this course, we hope to give you an understanding of the sort of practical insight combined with theory that leads to successful computation. For the television, we have a number of computer demonstrations with their supporting theory. And in this program, we're going to look at the roots of two equations. A simple one, deliberately chosen to illustrate some of the theory, and a larger, more practical problem. Here is the author of Unit 2 on nonlinear equations, Peter Thomas. Well, the first problem that we want to look at is to find the roots of this simple cubic equation. Now, by plotting a few points and sketching in the graph, we can see that it's got three real roots. And what we want to do is to find methods of locating these roots to a given accuracy. Well, to get to know the methods, the best thing is to use them, and to use them in conjunction with your calculator. Now, I've got my calculator with me here, and it's a bit larger than yours, but it's got exactly the same layout and does precisely the same functions. And I'm going to use it in exactly the same way that you would use yours. And I'm going to use it to find one of the roots of this cubic equation. And I'm going to use Newton's method. Well, here's the equation, and here's Newton's method. So all that remains to do is to write Newton's method with our function xr plus 1, xr, that's x cubed minus 5x plus 3 at r divided by the derivative, and that's simply found as 3xr squared minus 5. All well and good, but this formulation here isn't of very much use when we come to use our calculator. Now, you'll probably remember that in your calculator handbook, whenever you meet a polynomial, you're asked to use nested multiplication. So I'm going to rewrite this equation using nested multiplication. Now we're all ready to go. Well, which root shall we go for? Well, let's try for the root near zero. And for an initial starting value, we can take x naught equal to zero. So let's write that down. Now, we don't need the calculator at this point, because that's zero, that's zero. And in fact, the only things which aren't zero are the 3 and that minus 5 but we've got a minus sign over here, so we're just left with 3 fifths. That's 0 0.6. So x1 is just 0 0.6. Now, it's at this stage that we'll need to use the calculator. And I'm going to work through the iteration equation with you, and at the same time, I'm going to show you the calculations. Well, the first thing that we've got to do is to get the initial estimate, 0 0.6, into the calculator. So I'll key in 0 0.6. Six, and there it is on the display. Now, one of the most useful tips I can give you is always keep your current estimate in the memory. Now, that's easily done by pressing function store. And there you can see that 0 0.6 has gone into the memory. There's a little mark on the calculator to show you that that's happened. Now we're in a position to do this computation. First things first, x times x. Well, x is already there in the display, so that's simply times and equals minus 5 times xr. Now, xr is already in the memory, so we'll get that simply by function recall. Add on 3, and that's the numerator finished. Now, we want to divide that by the whole of this denominator. Now, we can use a very useful facility on this calculator of brackets, so that we can just carry on the computation directly by going open bracket, 3 times function recall, times function recall, 
minus 5, close the bracket. Now, to actually do the division, we'll press the equal sign, and there's our first correction term. And you can see it's fairly small, it's about 0.05. Now, there's a minus sign here, so I'll put that in. I now need to add on our first estimate, so that's plus function recall, and the answer for our x2, our second iterate, is 0.655. I'll write that down, record it for future use, 6551020204. To get our next iterate, x3, we just simply repeat the process. Now remember, put your current S iterate into the memory. So, function store. And away we go again. x times x. x is already there. Times equals minus 5 times memory, remember? Function recall. Plus 3 divided by open bracket 3 times function recall times function recall minus 5 close bracket equals and there's the next correction term and we can see that that's a bit smaller than it was before because now it's about 0.2 naughts 1 in goes the minus sign add it on to the previous estimate function recall equals and there's x3 now I'll just write that down once again 0.6566192 and if you wanted you can carry on and do some more iterations but I think already it's fairly obvious that our Newton's method is converging and you can see from x2 and x3 that in fact the first two places after the decimal point are in fact exactly the same. So that's Newton's method at work. And it's only by doing hand calculations like this that you'll actually get to grips with the method and with expressions like convergence and so on. Now you've just observed that Newton's method can converge quite quickly. But is it always so well behaved in practice? Well, I have a little computer demonstration to show you. It's over here. The computer's all ready to run with Newton's method, so let's see it at work. And there you can see our cubic, and we now need to put in a starting value. Now I'm going to choose a starting value of 1.2, so let's see that. Now for this demonstration, I'd like you to keep your eyes fixed on the column headed f of x. You can probably see that the function values are getting smaller. And indeed, after only six iterations, we've converged to the root near 0.65, and that was the one that we found with the calculator. Now, I want to change the starting value by just a small amount, by 0.02. So let's put in another starting value. 1.22. Again, concentrate on the f of x. Well, after a bit of a shaky start, we seem to be converging again. It took a little longer this time, but we've converged, all right, but this time to the large positive root at about 1.8. Well, if I change this starting value again, this time by only 0.01, you just watch what will happen.
So we've converged again, but this time to the small negative root. Well, let's just summarize that. We've found the small negative root with a starting value of 1.23. We then found the large positive root at 1.8 with a starting value of only 1.22. We then found the middle root, and that was with a starting value of 1.2. So these are somewhat strange results. And the only way that we could predict what was going on here would be to really know the method and to know the problem. Well, we've already sketched the curve of the cubic, and we know that the results that we've obtained by the computer are, in fact, the real roots of the equation. So the difficulty that we're encountering here must lie in the method. We look at the theory of iterations in Unit 2. The key idea is the idea of an iteration function. You can write any one-point iteration by the next iterate is some function of the previous iterate. It's this function g that we call the iteration function. You can think of the iteration in terms of two functions, g and the function x. At a root, the two functions have the same value. If xi is any other point, you evaluate g of xr, find where the function x has the same value, and that gives you xr plus 1. Now, how does this apply to Peter's problem? Here's the newton raphson formula, and here is the function g of x. Everything on the right is g of x. To see what this looks like, here's a computer plot of this function. It's quite complex, but where the line x cuts the function, give the roots. Even for a simple cubic, the newton raphson formula gives quite complex iteration function. I hope you can now see why Peter's iterations got into trouble. He chose starting values about 1.2 about here, where the curve is very steep. Because the curve's steep, small changes in x0 led to big changes in g of x0, and the iterations separated out. To see what happened, here's a computer plot for the starting value, see that a steep slope leads to unpredictable iterations. In fact, in Unit 2 we proved that if the iterations jump within a region, including a root, where the slope is less than 1 in magnitude, then they will converge. But outside such regions, the behavior is quite unpredictable. With the Newton iterations on the cubic, here the slope was steep, the iterations jumped around all over the place. Here we got into an interval where the curve is almost horizontal, and they converged quite rapidly. This one picture summarizes the strengths and the weaknesses of the newton raphson method. Look at the three roots. At each of them, g prime x, the slope of the iteration function, is exactly zero. This guarantees fast convergence if you get close to a root. But the, the price you pay is that away from a root, there are places where the curve is very steep. The moral is simple. If you're going to use the newton raphson method, to find a particular route, you must know your problem well enough to have a good starting value for it. So all very well, Bill's saying find good starting values, but how do you go about it? In the case of our simple cubic, it was very simple indeed, we simply sketched the graph. Now this is where our second example comes in. How about finding the roots of this thing? Well, to find good starting values, sketching it is not going to be a very easy matter at all, nor for that matter is differentiating it. 
Well, one method that we could use is to tabulate the function over an interval in which we're looking for roots. Now, we've got this already done for you by using the computer, so let's have a look at it. We'll tabulate the function on this screen here. Again, keep your eyes on the f of x column, and you can see that it's changing sign from negative, positive, back to negative, and so on. And wherever there's a sign change, we're going to suspect that there's a root. Well, to see more clearly what's going on, let's plot these results on the plotter here. You can see it plotting negative values. There's a sign change. And there's a very large positive value, followed by a very large negative value, which we couldn't get onto the paper either. There's another sign change. Large values again. Another sign change with a large value. Another sign change. And on it goes. In fact, if we'd allowed the plotter to continue, we would, in fact, have observed no more sign changes at all. Well, let's have a look at this in more detail. Starting here, these are the points, negative, swapping over to positive. There's a change in sign, so it looks as though there could be a root in that area here. The next sign change takes place here, between a very large positive value and a very large negative value. Now, because of these large values, it looks as though there's going to be a discontinuity here. So we're not too interested in that. The next sign change takes place near zero, between here and here. The small function values, so a good chance of a root in this area. The next sign change is more interesting. It's here between a very large positive value and a very large negative value. Maybe a discontinuity? Well, look at the next sign change. It's immediately after it. A very large value and a very small positive value. Well, I, for one, really don't know what's going on in this area. We really need to look at it in a lot more detail. But for the moment, let's just have a look at a place where we suspect there really is a root. Let's have a look at this region here. How could we find the root more accurately? Well, certainly we could tabulate the value in here, but that's a very slow process. Another method is the bisection method where we simply halve the interval and home in on the root. There again, that is very slow too. What we need is a fast economical method. Now, the fast method that we've seen in this program is Newton's method. But we've already said that this function is going to be very difficult to differentiate. So Newton's method's out. So we're still faced with a problem. We want a fast, efficient method, but one which doesn't use differentiation. Differentiation can be avoided by using the secant method. This uses two points. You evaluate the function of each of them, and this gives you the next value. This is the case where the function has the same sign at each of the two points. And here's the situation where the function changes sign. You can see that the new iterate lies between the other two. In practice, you'll often find that iterations jump between these two situations. The secant method behaves in practice much like the newton raphson method. That is, it can converge very quickly, but it can also go badly astray if you have the wrong starting values. Let's look at Peter's practical problem. Here, he had found two values with a sign change, and he assumed that there was an interval with a root in. Now, there's two possibilities. One is to use the slow, steady bisection method. The other is to use the secant method, using these two as the starting values and hoping that the iterates lie within this interval. Many practical root finding packages do in fact combine both methods. They try to use the secant method, but monitor progress and switch to the bisection method if things seem to be going wrong. Well, we've incorporated this idea of swapping between the bisection and secant methods in a general root finding package which you'll meet when you come to study Unit 4. So to finish the program, we thought we'd like to show you the general root finding package trying to find the roots of this very large equation. There's the first sign change, and it now tries to home in using the secant method. 
you see that the function values f of x are getting smaller and smaller, and it finds a root using the secret method. Let's carry on, see if we can find another sign change. Now you can see that it's decided that the bisection method is a better bet and swaps from bisection to secant and back again. In fact, the function values have become very large, so we suspect a discontinuity. Continuing the search, here's the sign change near zero, where we thought there was a root. In fact, we have found a root, but we've swapped between the secant and bisection again. If we continue, the next sign change is in that rather tricky area. Let's see what the computer makes of this. In fact, the function values are getting large again. So there's a discontinuity. Well, what about the next interval? Again, we start with the secant method. and there's a root there, and we've only had to use the secret method. So there are no more sign changes in the interval. Well, we hope that the two examples that we've shown you in this program, that's the simple cubic and this more horrific equation behind me, have illustrated some of the pitfalls that you can fall into when looking for roots of equations. And if there's one thing that you should remember, it's know the method and know your problem before you ever rush off to the computer to try and get numbers out of it. Today's program is linked with Unit 5 and gives some insight into how the simplex method handles linear programming problems. Computer time costs money, and in no field of scientific computing is more time used than in linear programming. Look at this problem. It's the multi-period model that we discuss in Unit 6. Each of these, three, these blocks down the diagonal corresponds to a single time period, and each block has the structure of the single time period model that we looked at in Unit 5. Now, we've left the zero elements here blank. And you can see that most of this matrix is in fact zero. It's a very sparse matrix. This is a very common structure in large linear programming models. This one probably looks huge to you. But in fact, by linear programming standards, it's quite small. When this problem was solved for us by a large computer, it took one second of computer time, a single second. Yet that computer is regularly used to solve problems that run for several hours. 
With computer time costing hundreds of pounds an hour, it's worth having an efficient program. Now, to teach the simplex method, we tend to use very small examples, like the one over here. But as you look at this example, remember, it is only an example. What we're trying to do is to develop a method for solving big problems. Now, this example, we see the same problem expressed in two forms, standard form, canonical form. In each case, the problem is to maximize this function, the objective of two variables x1 and x2. In the standard form, the, th the three constraints are expressed as inequalities. In the canonical form, the same constraints have slack variables added to them to make them into equations. In both cases, we want all the x's to be greater than or equal to zero. On the right, you see the graphical interpretation of the standard form. The first constraint is represented by that line, and the three constraints constrain us to this feasible region. The canonical form can be represented using the same diagram but giving a different interpretation to the lines. For example, for this constraint, the slack variable x3 is zero. Here, the slack variable x4 is zero. Here, the slack variable x5 is zero. We can represent the axes in a similar way. x1 is zero and x2 is zero. So, the same diagram but two different interpretations. What about the objective? Well, for various values of x1 and x2, we have a family of parallel lines. The optimum is this one. It is often convenient to rotate the whole figure so the objective is uphill. If you look here, this is the same diagram, but in this case, the objective function is horizontal. The idea is to get as high up as possible. Now, if you look at this figure, it's clear that wherever the highest point is, it must be at one of the corners of the feasible region. These are called vertices, or sometimes basic feasible solutions. The simplex method makes use of this key fact. You only need to look at the vertices. What the simplex method does is it starts at a known vertex, a known basic feasible solution, perhaps this one, the all slack solution. Then it moves from one solution to a neighbour, to a neighbour, always going uphill until the optimum is reached. With this in mind, I think you can see how we ought to proceed. First of all, we need a procedure for calculating individual vertices. Then we need some way to go from one vertex to another, to a neighbour, always going uphill. We find the test for going uphill is what we call the reduced costs. Finally, we want to see how to arrange these calculations for efficient computation. OK, let's start by looking at a vertex and seeing how we calculate the value of the variables there. Well, you can see that a vertex, such as this one, is defined by the intersection of two lines. Here we have x5 equals 0 and x2 equals 0. So we know the coordinates of the variables must be something like this. See, so we have these two variables 0 and these three non-zero. We call the non-zero variables basic variables and the zero variables non-basic variables. To calculate the values of the basic variables we use the canonical form. Here are the constraints. This is the matrix we call A. Suppose you want to calculate the vertex with x2 and x5 equals 0. Setting these variables to 0 means that you can forget about these two columns of A. Notice the number of variables to set to zero is chosen so you get a square matrix. We call this B. You are left with three equations in three unknowns. And if B is non-singular, you can write the solution as the inverse of B times the right-hand side. This gives a way of finding the values of the basic variables, the non-zero variables. You still have to check that these values are non-negative. If they are, this basic solution becomes a basic feasible solution. So I'm going across the computer terminal now to calculate the values of these basic variables. I'm using this video terminal because it's quicker than the teletype terminals. There you see the basis matrix B, and here is its inverse. 
Multiplying that into the right-hand sides, we get the value of the variables. These are the basic variables. Remember, the other two variables were set to zero before we started. You see that those values are all positive, so our basic solution is indeed a basic feasible solution. Normally, inverting a matrix is the world's worst way of solving a set of linear equations. But it's convenient in the simplex method because it enables us to calculate the neighboring vertex very easily. To have a look at neighboring vertex, let's go back to the diagram. We were at this vertex. Suppose we wanted to move to this vertex. Well, here we see x4 is 0, x5 is 0. We've got something like this. If you compare these two neighboring vertices, you can see that one of the non-basic variables, one which was previously 0, has now increased in value to be a basic variable, and one of the previous basic variables has now been set to 0. It's a, a non-basic. So you see we have a variable to come into the basis and a variable to go out of the basis. If we go back to the computer terminal, I can show you a very interesting and important fact about the basis matrix B. Here is the old basis matrix, and here is the new basis matrix. Notice that because we only changed one variable, these two matrices are identical except for one column which has been changed. This is very important and we'll come back to it later. So now you know how to calculate the values of variables at a basis and how to check if it is feasible. The next thing you want to do is to have some way of going to a neighboring vertex, making sure that you always go uphill. Now for this we need to go into the main loop of the simplex method. To describe it, here is Paul Williams. In order to maintain an overview of what is going on in the simplex method, we have here a very simple flowchart of the procedure. It is an iterative procedure in which we successively go round this central loop again and again. On each iteration, we choose a variable to enter the basis, that is a variable which is non-basic, which is zero. This variable enters the basis, it replaces an existing variable in the basis, each of these boxes does, of course, represent a substantial amount of calculation, which we're going to say more about in the program. But it's important to keep sight of the wood for the trees. In the little two-dimensional example we've just been considering, once we decided which way to go around the feasible region, there was no choice regarding which edges we took uphill. We're now going to look at a slightly more ambitious problem where there often is a genuine choice. This is a problem involving three variables where we want to maximize this expression relating the three variables. Three variables are x1, x2, and x3. We've added three slack variables, x4, x5, and x6, into the three constraints in order to put the problem in canonical form. We must remember, of course, as in most linear programming problems, we don't allow the variables to be negative. Because this problem only originally had three variables, we can again give it a geometrical representation. Our three original variables give us our three directions in space, x1, x2, and round the back, x3. Each of the faces of this model, each of the top three faces, correspond to the three constraints of our original problem. For example, the first constraint is exactly satisfied on this face. The slack variable in the first constraint is zero. Similarly, the slack variables in the other two constraints are zero on two of the other faces. Our three original variables are zero on the three remaining faces. Because this problem is in three dimensions, each vertex occurs at the junction of three faces. So we can say that each, at each vertex, exactly three variables will be zero. So if we take a vertex, 
we can set three variables zero. This leaves us with three equations in the remaining three variables. This gives us a basic solution. So vertex solutions on this model correspond to basic solutions in our problem. We've arranged things again so that the objective plane is horizontal, so we can regard our objective as trying to get up as high as possible. Because we work with basic solutions, we would like to know how to move from one basic solution to another, from one vertex to another. Let's suppose for the moment that we were at a particular vertex of this model. Let's suppose the, that we were at this vertex. This is the junction of these three faces. At this vertex, x2, x3, and x5 are our non-basic variables. They are zero. We would like to know which new vertex we could beneficially move to. How, we, how should we move up? In order to do this, we're going to calculate the slopes of the edges moving up from the vertex. We would also, of course, like to know how far we should move up. This involves a bit more calculation. We're just going to look at the slopes of the edges from this vertex. And these slopes are represented by quantities known as the reduced costs of the corresponding non-basic variables. So what we would like to know here are the reduced costs of the variables x2, x3, and x5. In order to do this, we're going to go to the computer. For that vertex, here is the inverse basis. Use it to calculate the value of the variables. And now we want to look at the slopes. That involves calculating the so-called reduced costs. For the time being, I'm going to leave out how we do this calculation. I just want to look how to interpret them. By an unfortunate convention, positive slopes are represented by negative reduced costs and vice versa. So if you look at this case, you can see the reduced cost corresponding to the non-basic variable x5 is positive, the slope is negative, that's downhill, we'd lose by bringing that variable in. Both the other two non-basic variables have negative reduced costs, so either would be an improvement. But if you look at the magnitude of them, you see that the reduced cost corresponding to x3 is considerably steeper than that corresponding to x2. It's got a greater magnitude. Therefore, we have a greater slope corresponding to x3, so it appears that the variable to bring into the ba basis is x3. x3 enters the basis, so we leave this face and climb up this edge. How far should we go up it? Well, this usually requires a bit of calculation, but we can cheat and look at the back of the model. In fact, we carry on until we reach this face, where x4 becomes 0. x4, in fact, leaves the basis. So we end up at this vertex. Right, let's see where we are on our flow chart. We have decided which variable should enter the basis by looking at the reduced costs. We generally take the variable with the most negative reduced cost. This gives us the steepest slope uphill. This variable enters the basis and displaces a variable from the existing basis. To decide which variable is displaced needs a bit of calculation. It involves a ratio test, which is described in the unit, but we don't propose to discuss it any further in this program. Having now got to a new basis, we have to calculate the inverse of the new basis matrix. This is most conveniently done from the inverse of the old basis matrix, and we use a process known as pivoting. Pivoting can involve a great deal of computation, so it's worth taking considerable effort to do it efficiently. Let's start with a problem in canonical form. It proves useful to introduce a new variable x0 and treat the objective function as just another constraint. Adding the original constraints, this can be written in partitioned form as the augmented constraint matrix. The partition matrix we get on the left is the one we call A tilde. For a vertex, we set several variables to zero and close up A tilde to get a square matrix called B tilde. When we invert B tilde, we get B tilde to the minus one. 
Everything you need to know about a basic feasible solution is contained in this inverse matrix. And everything in this inverse matrix is useful. For example, the elements of the top row are what we call the shadow prices. And in Unit 5, we show you that if you multiply the shadow prices into the columns of the augmented matrix A2, you get at a single step the reduced costs. When you go from one basic feasible solution to another, you change B tilde by a single column, as we saw before. The, what's the corresponding change in its inverse? Well, if you think of it, in general, if you have two matrices, P and Q, which differ only in a single column, you can write P equals QT, where T is an elementary matrix. And the inverse of P is the product of the other two inverses. In a similar manner, we have, can calculate our new inverse as simply the old inverse multiplied by this matrix, which looks like H, but is in fact the Greek capital letter, eta. So all that's involved in pivoting from one basic feasible solution to another lies in calculating this single eta matrix. We go around this loop again and again until none of the reduced costs are negative, or we see that this can never happen in the case of the un an unbounded problem. Of course, we've left out quite a lot of um, important features, such as how we get started in the first place. But this is the essential cycle of a simplex algorithm. It's a very simple idea, although some of the calculation in some of these boxes may be quite detailed. But it's remarkable how such a simple idea has proved so powerful on solving often quite huge practical problems. Right, let's now go back and look at our small example and solve this problem from scratch. To start with, we are going to take the so-called all-slack basis. In this example, we're lucky. If we equate all the original variables to zero, we, get, we obtain this vertex. We have a feasible basic solution to start with. Let's see if the computer can tell us how we should proceed. One of the advantages of the all-slack solution is that the inverse basis is very easy to c calculate. It is, in fact, just the identity matrix. Remember, we're using the augmented form here, so we have a 4x4 four four matrix rather than a 3x3. Three three. And the variable x0 represents the value of the objective. We calculate the reduced costs. All three are negative. Any one of those variables could profitably enter the basis. We choose the most negative one. That's x1. And the ratio test tells us the variable to leave the basis is x5. x1 in and x5 out. x1 enters the basis. We therefore climb up the x1 axis until we reach the face x5 equals naught. x5 leaves the basis. How should we proceed from this vertex? Well, we calculate the new inverse basis. In practice, we'd only calculate the eta matrix, but here's the full basic matrix so you can look at it. Here are the variables. Notice that x0, the objective, has indeed increased in value. The reduced costs? Well, this is the vertex we looked at before, and we chose the most negative reduced cost, which corresponded to x3. The ratio test, available to leave the basis, is x4 x3 in, x4 out. x3 in, we leave this face and climb up this edge to a new vertex. How should we now proceed? Well, this is exactly the same as before. Here is the inverse basis matrix and here are the values of the variables. Calculate the reduced costs. Only one of them is negative, so we choose x2 to come into the basis, and the ratio tells us that it's x6 that leaves. x2 now enters the basis, so we climb up this edge to this vertex. Now looking at our problem, where we've got geometrical insight, we can see that we've obviously reached the top, we've reached the optimal solution. But can the computer spot this? OK, we calculate the new set of reduced costs for this basis, Notice 
they're all positive. The slope is downwards in every direction from this basic solution. That means whatever we do, we can't do better, and we have indeed found the optimum. So there it is. We've seen how the simplex work method works by looking at two very small problems. But remember, all along, what we're after is a method for solving the big ones. There are two written units about the simplex method, and they follow this same path. In unit five, we look at very simple problems and use them to develop the method and some of its theory. Then in unit six, we go on and see how to develop the method to solve large practical problems.